Okay, I'm Jade Kopel and I have been in the marketing world for most of my career. I spent, I studied marketing at university and then spent the next 10 years building the Sorbet brand with my family. And I was the marketing manager there. So again, living in a creative world. And when I left Sorbet, I was kind of in between chapters in my life and I was looking for something to do. And I actually bumped into Danny, who was an old school friend of mine. And she comes from the marketing world as well. And so we decided we would have a coffee. And that's how we got here. So, yeah, I'm Danny Silberman. And like Jade, I came from a branding and marketing creative background. I'd always been involved in product and um, project management in the FMCG sector. I had done quite a bit of um, NGO work. And when my son was born, I started a mom blog, actually, and uh, I focused mostly on, on baby recipes and how to feed one's kid. It, I did start to get quite a trajectory of following um, with about 20,000 followers. It was called Baby Jake's Mom, and it, I didn't realize how competitive and hectic the space was, so I sort of, when he was about one, I actually stopped blogging, and then Jade found me, <laughs> and I was like, should we start our own business? And we that was the start of Twitter. Yeah, we kind of met for a coffee. I've got three girls. Daddy's got two boys. We thought, let's do something in the kids' creative space. And the rest was history after that. The idea came one day sitting on my lounge floor. We were chatting around how sneakers have become this like cultural icon of society everyone was wearing them everyone had a pair they were expressive and colorful and unique and some were affordable and some were collector's items and we were just talking generally about sneakers and then we came up with this like a deer kind of arrived unannounced and we thought how cool would it be if you could have an interchangeable kid sneaker so something that you could change the look of the shoe entirely every single day. So you would wear the rainbow the one day and the blue bunny the next day, and you would match any outfit that you wanted. It would help moms in the dress myself department who we all know little kids who want to be expressive and themselves. It would also help buying one pair with so many different ways to wear it. And so this idea just kind of started evolving. Um, you know, we, yeah, we kind of bashed it around a while. We, we, from there, we pretty much did what any budding entrepreneur would do. And we hit Google. And I think we must have Googled for, I mean, in, in this, this has been a three and a half year journey, but I think the first three months of that journey were, were spent <laughs> on Google. And we, we wanted to see if we could find, to find if the concept if existed. If they existed. And we could not find a single concept out there, which actually was, you know, this fully interchangeable sneaker. Um, perhaps that was a sign that we we should have abandoned cart or jumped <laughs> ship at that stage. But maybe that was, you know, maybe that was enough to keep us going and to actually pursue the, the idea that we had. Um, and yeah, this kind of small discovery that no one out there was actually changing an entire shoe. Like you could... You could customize a shoe. There were a few brands that were letting you customize shoes. You could change the laces of shoes, but not in its entirety. And once we discovered this, that small discovery was kind of enough for us to book a trip to China uh, in search of a factory and some validation, possibly. Except that we arrived like two literal deers in the headlights, these two girls in this massive industrial, you know, this huge city in Material China. Material district of Guangzhou. Um, yeah, Guangzhou, <laughs> the biggest um, manufacturing district in China. And we were like, okay, well, we need a factory to make this shoe idea that we have in our head. And we started the journey and the search. And we went to the Canton Fair, which is the world's biggest trade fair in manufacturing in the world and we met a factory and we started to discuss the prototype of them and they said to us well you know where to from here and we said we had been told by a friend who had guided us and you know some of the advice we've been given if you want to know if a factory is legit then you need to ask them if you can actually see their manufacturing line and to actually go and see the, the actual physical store yeah we were told go and see the factory so like, the guy said to us like well, yeah, but I mean, the factory is 
you know, a two hour flight away. And then you've got to take like a, a taxi for at least two hours. And it's quite far. And it's in like a tiny little city outside of this place and this place. And we're like, okay, cool. We'll, yeah. we'll call your bluff and we'll come we'll book a see flight. We'll book <laughs> we didn't tell our mothers though, <laughs> that we were doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and we did try to send like a live location thing, but I mean like WhatsApp doesn't work in China. So. No, we didn't. We, we, we literally bought this flight and we told no one and we got on. Um, but yeah, we landed in this in for zoo and we went to see their factory and actually it was amazing and eye opening and we learned so much there. And there we were sitting around a table designing a shoe and kind of like full disclaimer, neither of us are qualified to design any product. I can't even <laughs> bake a cake. <laughs> Much less a kid sneaker. And, and now so we're designing. We had to a learn shoe. a lot. Yeah. We were learning about the upper and the fabrics and the grain in the fabric and the strength of the Velcro and, and the and thickness of the inner sole. And how the shoe has to be ergonomic for a kid's foot so that it can bend in the right way. So, you know, like all the dynamics that you have to think about when designing a kid's shoe not just any shoe but a kid's shoe yeah um, and and so we finished up and we were happy with kind of what had come out of this meeting and we had left there with a really good idea of what the shoe was going to look like and we arrived back home and that was in November 2019 so I think we pretty much took the last flight out of China <laughs> And then this pandemic hit and the world was turned upside down and we arrived home on this massive high of, oh my gosh, we have a shoe, we have an idea, this is actually going to happen, like we can't believe it, to this incredible low of our factory shut down, our schools are shutting down, people are dying, this world is a mess, and here we are trying to design a shoe with glitter on it. Um, and this was really the time when we thought maybe we should abandon cart and and maybe hold or pause on this idea. Also, I think the realization that we're going to be designing this shoe over WeChat in broken English, very, very broken, very English. broken English, um, was super overwhelming. Uh, and we we actually at that point had to dig really deep and make some really tough decisions. Uh, but we made the decision to carry on and we had come this far and we just thought, yeah. what's, what do we got to lose? And I, I think one of the, the most challenging things that came, you know, that we faced in this time in terms of the brand purpose and the identity of Joy Joy was could something as seemingly simple as a kid sneaker actually go about what we wanted to do and that's bring joy to a kid? Is it Was it actually feasible and possible and could the brand purpose actually come alive? And that's when we really started to really go deep into what Joy Joy meant to us. And I think we got the, the biggest sort of validation um, and the answer came to us when our final sample box arrived. Mm -hmm. It was a huge box. We, we had had prototypes going up and down throughout the year. And this box arrived. Um, you know, the, the customs tape was strapped all over it and we called um, the five collective kids between the two of us. And... They ripped came off the we were riding, the we were sitting on the carpet and they ripped off this tape and out came these hundreds of snaps that we had designed. Which, you know, we call the straps over the sneaker Joy Joy Sneaker Snap. This is the cheery one. And they they came downstairs and each of them just started to come alive with choosing the snap that they preferred most. And Jade's one twin was like, I love the heart. And my little boys were like, but I love this one and I love the rainbow. And no, give me this one and give me that one. And we watched Joy Joy come alive. And it was in that moment that we literally both looked at each other and we were like, Jane, I think we, I think we did this. I think, and I think we should carry on doing it. Yeah. It was the biggest sense of validation that we had ever had because I think the whole time we had this really low grade level anxiety. Uh, will it work? Will mothers buy it? Will kids want to wear it? Will no one wear it? Will no one want to buy it? Oh my God, we can't. Like, how can we make this shoe? Like, no one's going to wear the shoe. And the, the anxiety was just constant until that moment where we saw our kids and the joy that it brought to them. And we were just like, wow, like, yeah, I think we can do this. And this is joy, joy. And, and we felt joy watching them and they felt joy snapping and flapping and mixing and matching. And so we decided on the name Joy Joy um double joy one for the parents and one for the kids and always everything in a pair you know it's always like two shoes and Danny and I and shoes and snaps and the the double joy idea just really fitted beautifully into our brand um, and, and, and the, so we started to design it around this idea of double joy and adding joy and the, and the 
the heart of it for us is that we, you know, at the end of the day, it's just this plain white sneaker. That's actually what we're just giving you. We're giving you this blank canvas and that's the one joy. But we really need the customer and the parents and that collection and collaboration with the kids to come alive. And when you start snapping and you're putting that, that snap on and that's the kid's expression and their creative freedom and their finding who they are through that sneaker snap, that's when the double joy starts to come in. And that's when you get your, your two joys. And for us, like we're not stopping at one joy. That's never enough for us. We're going to just keep seeing what we can do to add the extra joy and the extra joy. And through everything we're doing, through the customer journey, through customer service and through the whole thing, we just keep asking ourselves like every day, it's like, Jade, is this enough joy? What can we do to like, where is that joy joy? Yeah. How can we add more joy? And what can we do that's going to put a smile on someone's face? And, you know, when we see these shoes out, we call it in the wild on people that we spot in a shopping center or somewhere out. Um, it's, it's so much joy for us to see people wearing them and loving them. Um, and so we've, Come, we imported a thousand pairs. Um, they arrived at the Durban port in last November and we decided to sell online um, originally. And now we're selling, we're taking the business one shoe at a time. <laughs> I think from my side, um, it's really, it's really hard to do both. It's hard to throw yourself into a business and to raise kids at the same time. Uh, you feel constantly stretched and challenged and demanding. But I think for me, if you can find a community of moms that can help you when you need to, like I remember taking that trip to China and I called a mom to say, I have three kids and I need you to help me with all of my lifts. And she just said, like, schedule me in, like, whatever it is, just schedule me in. And I phoned the next mom and she was like, schedule me in, almost as if it was just kind of part of their job description. Um, it was the most amazing privilege for me to have that. And it was kind of like, you go out and follow your dreams and I've got your kids back. And I know that when it's my turn that you'll do the same for me. Um, and I think my advice is just start. Like just start, start something um, with what you've got, with what you can use, with who you are right now, just start because delaying and delaying and delaying will always lead you in different directions and you might never actually get around to doing what you want to do. And I, I think my advice would be to just to start. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, that's a really good one. <laughs> I mean, we, three and a half years, we were like, start 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 and it, it took us really long but we did start but yeah um you can just dive in much quicker and just get it done but from from my side in terms of the the mom the mom dynamic um absolutely what jay touched on the the constant pull and the the guilt that comes with it um, my kids constantly will be like but you know you're always at joy joy you're always working but I could, what I'm so, sort of now trying to do is to totally like involve them. Like today I took my, my son to the office and I got him to help me pack the orders and we made it fun. And he was like, I was like, are you having fun? And he's like, uh, but you're going to pay me pocket money, right? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I guess why not? And then I was like starting to like, teach him and show him. And like, this is actually what building a business is about. And in that way, like it's sort of going to become a bit more of like maybe an integrated family culture and start that like family business dynamic even. Mm. Um, but the actual, in terms of actual advice, in terms of a mompreneur who wants to sort of go out there, and that's one of the things Jade and I have leaned on in addition to the mom community of friends, is advice from people who've been there and, and done this already. And, you know, you always sort of feel intimidated to ask someone or you're like, well, you know, why would they give me their time? Or they're so much more successful. Like, you know, why would they want to help us out? And we just sort of went all in and would just shamelessly ask people or like even family friends or you know someone that you know our husbands knew or our husband's husband's friends of a friend of a friend and we would ask and they would come so willingly to just sit with us or give us two hours of their time or three hours of their time or still giving us their time just give us advice and going in you know even someone I met in a coffee shop she I just heard she mentioned that she had this retail experience and I was like well can I have your number and can we meet for a coffee and people hmm. It does, well, what goes around really does come around. And it was just incredible to learn from people and to read the books and to put yourself out there and the advice. And there's so much free content online in terms of 
how to, you know, whether it's running a Facebook ad campaign or learning how to understand business dynamics. And Jade's amazing with that. She's always reading another business book. And I only ever used to read novels, but Jade, every day she's like, here's another book, here's another book. But just in terms of, you can upskill yourself and you can ask people for help and they want to share their knowledge. In a um, selfless way. Yeah. It's not transactional at all. It's actually really selfless. Like, it's not, I'll give you this deal if I'm in on it or how can I, um, you know, what you can know, I have like in exchange? Can, you know, if, if your business works, can we have shares one day? Yes, yes. Yeah. This is just like selfless. Like we just want to see you do well. And, you know, it's as moms, it's incredibly, it's as Danny used a really important word, it's really guilt associated. And you can always feel, am I giving enough? And where do I put more and, and and this idea of balance is actually um not it's a fairy tale mm. you know I just I don't think you can find the balance and I'm not sure why we in pursuit of the balance sometimes I have to give more to my business and sometimes I have to give more to my kids and that's okay and it's okay to cut the guilt and it's okay to be a little bit imbalanced and it's okay to feel exhausted but excited um and I think as moms that we have so much to offer um, in terms of our compassion, our intu intuition about business, um, we have so much in us. And I just wish that more business, that more women would, as Sheryl Sandberg would say, lean in. Mm. And take the pressure off. I think that's mm. also, mm. take the pressure off and also just to um, not shield our kids as much as well. I mean, touching on what I, I said, not to like, you know, run on too much about it, but I think we're also so protective of our kids that they you know, they're not going to cope or like, you know, what are they going to do without us at home 24 seven? And like I said, like, I just, I'm also starting to explain to my kids a bit more, you know, like mommy's work and we have to go out and all the things you see around you yeah. and where, where do you think it comes from? And making them understand that it's not as simple. It's okay for me to not be at home throughout your day. And if it, I'm not home at night either, that's also okay. And I'm not a bad mom because I'm not there.